those who worship us together, then Christ himself will dwell in the midst. Let's worship him. Let us worship him. Hallelujah. Let us worship him. Glory be to God. We are coming to his house. Magnify his name and worship him. We are coming to his house to magnify his name and worship him. We are coming to his house to magnify his name and worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, worship Christ the Lord. Just forget about yourself Concentrate on him and worship him. Just forget about yourself. Concentrate on him and worship him. Just forget about yourself. Concentrate on him and worship Christ the Lord. Worship him.
let's praise the Lord. Hallelujah. For anyone that loves Almighty God, let's praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let us give God the praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let us lift up the name of Jesus. Who oh, God is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. From the uprising of the sun. Hallelujah. Unto the going down of the same. He's worthy. Hallelujah. He's worthy. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Hallelujah, as we are worshipping, you know, uh, if anything that this last 18 months, two years has taught me is that none of us know, hallelujah, if we're going to wake up tomorrow, if we're going to wake up next week, if we're going to do anything. So I have got to the point that when I get the chance to worship him, and to praise him, I will. Hallelujah. Is there anybody in the house that believes the same thing? Hallelujah. 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 This week, we uh, were notified of the Queen's, Queen Elizabeth II's passing. And our condolence and prayers go with the royal family. Hallelujah. And it wasn't even something that the nation were expecting. Hallelujah. We know that she was elderly. We even know that on the Tuesday she was in meetings with the new Prime Minister. But by the Thursday, hallelujah, um, it was God's wish. Hallelujah. So every time we get the chance to praise him, let's praise him. Hallelujah. Every time we get a chance to tell somebody that I love you, hallelujah, let us tell them that we love them, hallelujah, and praise God. Shall we praise the Lord? Shall we praise the Lord, hallelujah? Shall we give God the glory, hallelujah? Hallelujah. I'm just going to hand over to our minister for just to welcome everyone this morning as they're coming in. and. We um, know that we had a late night last night, so people will be coming in. So as they're coming in, um, we're just going to continue worshipping in Jesus' name. Hallelujah.
Thank God for the things that he's about to do for you. Hallelujah. That bill that's going to be paid. And somewhere, hallelujah, God provided the resource. Hallelujah. That healing, hallelujah, that you thought, hallelujah, was going to be something that you'd never, ever be delivered from. But God delivered. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank him for what he's done. But we thank him for who he is. Hallelujah. He's our comforter. He's our provider. He's the lover of our soul. Let's just praise him and worship him. Just you and God. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, hallelujah. We are told that when the praises go up, hallelujah, then the blessings come down. Hallelujah. When we begin to praise and worship God, hallelujah, God summons angels and ministering spirits into the atmosphere, hallelujah, there's angels, hallelujah, upon the rastrum, angels in the congregation, angels at the front of the church, angels at the back of the church, hallelujah, Hallelujah, revelation. We are told that the angels bow down, hallelujah, before the most high God and cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. But God has given us a greater gift that we, hallelujah, baptize in Jesus' name, filled with his Holy Spirit. We are called his children, hallelujah. We are heirs and joint heirs, hallelujah. That when we speak those things that be not, we can command things to happen. We can command things to come to pass, hallelujah. When we worship him, hallelujah. When we glorify him, hallelujah. God just leads over on his throne and says, I'm going to give them, hallelujah. I'm going to give them, hallelujah, because they're worshipping me, because they're thanking me, and because they are glorifying me, hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. There is none like you. Hallelujah. Jehovah is your name.
presence of God, hallelujah, who is first and foremost in our lives, hallelujah, hallelujah, glory be to God. Isn't God awesome? Hallelujah. Isn't God excellent? Isn't he wonderful? Hallelujah. We just thank him and give him the glory. Um, just want to give honor to our Bishop Andrew and Evangelist in their absence and um, Evangelist Renee. Um, give honor once again to our um, guest and friend. Glory be to God. Thank you so much for um, coming and it's awesome worshiping with you. To all our to our missionary Smith, heaven bless you, Mark. So good to see you in the house of God. God bless you. To our missionary Hibbert, um, who we haven't seen for a couple of weeks, but to God be the praise. Hallelujah. To all our my brothers and my sisters, the children that will be coming in soon, I greet you all in the mighty name of Jesus. Those who are listening on social media and youtube i greet you in jesus name hallelujah isn't god awesome isn't god awesome Amen. hallelujah and if nobody else has come to praise god i have you know the most awesome services that i have are those in my bedroom or my bathroom where it's just me and god no choir no praise and worship no pastors, just me and God. Hallelujah. So if we can worship God like that in solitude, what about when we get into his presence and into his sanctuary? Hallelujah. We're going to worship God um, this afternoon in the beauty of holiness. And if you can turn your Pentecostal hymnals to um, 296, Great is the Lord. Hallelujah. Great is the Lord, and we'll sing the first, second, and the last verse together. Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord, the Prince of life and glory. Great.
Santa, in the loud voice, glorify God. And Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Verse 19 and 20, we'll read together. And he said unto him, Arise, walk thy way, thy faith has made thee whole well. Glory to God, praise and thanks for the reading of his holy words. Go thy way, thy faith has made thee whole. Hallelujah. We are approaching a very significant point in um, this service. We're, we're just going to take some time, um, although it may be just about thanking God for what He's done. For others, it might just be about putting our pleas and our needs before God so that He can meet them. So, for those who um, are needing prayer, the altar is here open for you to come and for someone to lay a hand on you at this time in agreement. That whatever you desire and whatever you need, God is able to provide. Hallelujah. If you could all just stand with me as we sing just this chorus, you made a way. And I'm going to ask the ask now, Sister Tracy, just to lead us <coughs> to prayer. You made a
church, oh God, you know us by name. You know us by nature, Lord. I'm asking you to attend us to every need today. Lord, remember us today, oh God. Lord Jesus, I'm asking you to visit us in this service today. God, I'm asking you to rip off that agenda. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, hallelujah.
Thank you, Jesus. 
many soldiers that had given their lives in the service of the country. So she said, you know what, the least I can do is give my life back in the service of this nation. Because there were many men that had died on the battlefield, hundreds of thousands, millions that had died on the battlefield in the service of the king. And you know, some came to me, Sing a song, number 36 for the men of the Lord. I mean, God, if I walk in the pathway of duty, if I work till the close of the day, I shall see the great King who is in heaven when I've gone to the last mile of the way. Queen Elizabeth served from the time she was. She wasn't down the coal mines. Maybe she wasn't doing the poor soul in the earth. Maybe she wasn't on the shop floor. But she had her duties to perform. And her duties meant that her life was suited. Nobody's ever going to say they saw Queen Elizabeth down the pole. A little bit too tipsy. Nobody's ever going to say they saw Queen Elizabeth with her dress too short with her blouse too far open, looking a mess. No, Queen Elizabeth always looked the part of a queen. She always looked the part of a princess. Queen Elizabeth knew that the eyes of the world were always on her. And so she had to live a certain style. She had to live a certain way. So, then to us, our lesson today from Luke chapter 17. And Luke chapter 17, verse, verse 7, stands and reads, and I'm going to focus on the future. But which of you, having a servant, plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him, by and by, when he is come from the field, go and sit down to eat? And will not rather say unto him, make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me, till I have eaten and drunk. And afterwards thou shalt eat and drink. Does he thank the servant because he did the things that were commanded him and shall not be the right thing unto him? So likewise ye, when ye have done all those things which are commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants, we have done that which was our duty to do. So when you want to look at it, there is a call on our lives. And it's actually a higher call than what Queen Elizabeth had to go through. It's a call on the King of Kings. You see, Queen Elizabeth has been queen for 70 years. We now have a new king. And I can probably say with good confidence, Charles isn't going to be king for 70 years because he would live to about 140. Not many of us do that nowadays. Charles' reign is possibly going to be 20, 25, at best 30 years. It would take him over 100. He's a 73 at the moment. His family has good genes. His father died at 99. His mother died at 96. So chances are he's going to live into his 90. But he's an earthly king. We serve the king of kings. The Bible tells me that all of the kings are going to cast their crowns before Jesus. So no matter how mighty you are, we serve the king of kings. We serve the Lord God Almighty. Now, servants in the olden days Slaves, strong servants, they would have a dual duty to do. They would. Israel was an agricultural nation. 
So the majority of work had to do with farm work, field work. It was out in the field, it was back breaking. You had to get, you had to work the plow, you would maybe have to dig, you would have to root and pick up the, the grain and stuff. They didn't have combine harnesses like how we have now. There was no automation. It was manual labor. And so after a day in the field, you'd be tired. You didn't need that. You'd work in the field all day, and I don't imagine that they had a 10 o'clock start. I'm imagining that it was like a 6 o'clock start in the morning. And it may have been 6 in the morning through till 6 in the evening. If you worked a back-breaking day in the heat of the sun, and you come home, and your master says to you, I'm hungry. Go get me some food. Nowadays, someone goes to school. Sure. You know, she's been working on the field all day, man. What wrong with you? You can't do that. This is your master. This is the person that owns you. This is the person that has the title deeds, more or less, to your life. So he says, go and make ready. He said, I made So I may sit down and eat dinner. Now, again, Tired. You can't slap that shit in there either. You take it down, just take it down the seat. You see that? You're going to have to serve it with grace. You're going to have to serve it with humility. You're going to have to make sure that it's, it's not too hot. It's not too cold. It's just right. And for the little ones, you remember the story of Goldilocks and the two bears. Goldilocks, she had snuck into the house. One porridge was too hot, one porridge was too cold, but this one was just right. But that's how you're going to have to serve your master. It's got to be just right. Saints, the Lord Jesus Christ isn't going to take any and anything from us. We give him slap that service. We come when we feel like it. We don't come if we don't feel like it. When I come, I close my mouth. I'm not going to open it. I'm not going to give him any praise at all. I'm going to do whatever I feel like it. Oh, uh, you know what? God will accept it. Actually, he won't. <laughs> Actually, there's a level of service that we have to perform. And the other thing is that we've got to perform service with a smile. I can't come, and I've been working in the field all day. I'm tired. I'm grumpy. I'm frustrated. So the master says, serve me dinner, please. I better fix my face. I better fix it good. You know, when Nehemiah said that he was cupbearer, he said, I'm cupbearer to the king. And he made a point in the writing, he said, I've never been sad in the king's presence before. Because sadness is going to make the king question what's going on. And as the king's cupbearer, he's the person that tasted the wine, tasted the food before the king ate to make sure it wasn't poisoned. Now, if my face is vexed, the king's going to think, I wonder if treason is afoot. And they're not going to leave my head. So Nehemiah realized that I can't be sad in front of the king. So when we're serving the king, when duty calls, we have to serve. We have to serve with gladness. I think that's one of the Psalms. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with, with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. So, we're serving the Lord. Our service isn't little optional. Our service is We're bought with a price, not of silver, not of gold. We're bought with the price of the blood of Jesus. Now, the thing I was beginning to realize is, you know, some people would have said, you know what, I will make a sacrifice myself. There would be some people brave enough to say, I'm going to die for my own sins. You know what, God, I don't need you to die for my sins. I'm going to die for my own sins. The only problem is, 
If I die from my own sins, I'm still going to have died in sin. Because I'm sinful. Every human person that has ever lived other than Jesus Christ was born in sin, lived in sin, died of sin. But Jesus came to free us from sin. He's the only person that could do it. So, my life now belongs to him. I'm like the bond servant in this lesson here. And I'm going to work for Jesus and work for Jesus and work for Jesus. When I'm tired, I'm meant to work for Jesus. When I'm upset, I'm meant to work for Jesus. When I think I don't have enough time on my hands, certain brand of food. So it means I have my agenda in life for what I want. But if you're a servant, you don't really have that choice. Do you? If you're a servant, what you do is what the master says to do. The problem is sometimes we don't know what the master's saying because we're doing this. La, la, la. If we put other things first, sometimes our mind is too crowded for too many things. You know, since if I'm honest with you, it was a struggle. It's only because I said, Lord, I need you to speak to me. There's so much stuff in my life going on right now that it was a struggle just to get through the week. One of those weeks where I was absolutely Somebody else had to deliver the word this morning. It was sitting me down to the ground. Because I was so tired, mentally, physically. But I'm realizing I'm a servant. And I'm realizing that as a servant, I've got to do what God says to do. And a lot of the times, it isn't convenient with what I want. And so the Queen, that statement from 1947, I'm going to serve the people of this country. And she knew the way that she would have to serve them. Use that. Her life as Elizabeth. Almost no longer exists. It's Queen Elizabeth. And as Queen Elizabeth, she has a lot of duties. I would imagine sometimes she was maybe meeting the people, some of the overseas um, delegates from different countries. And I would imagine sometimes she didn't really want to meet them. And I imagine sometimes she's like, I don't feel I really have to go through any of this. Do I really have to listen to this mumbo jumbo? But she did. Because that was her duty. Saints, we are called as children of God to pray. That's our duty. We're called to fast. Duty. Jesus said, when we fast. Not if. Not if you can be bothered. But he said, when you fast. When you pray. So, that tells me that it's something that we're meant to be doing. That God wants us to be doing all of the time. When you fast. When you pray. We're told that we need to come into the house of God and sing praises. So, we need to come and sing praises. It's our duty. Now, here's the problem. She 
duty is described as a moral or a legal obligation. It's a moral or legal obligation. It's a responsibility. Furthermore, it says it's a task or action that you're required to perform as part of your job. So, that's duty. It's a legal responsibility. Now, if we look at duty in economics, we talk about duty on goods, on products. Realistically, it's a tax. So, duty on products is a tax. Tax. Anybody here glad to pay tax? No? I don't think I, no, I don't see any hands. No. For us, we consider tax as a burden. Duty, it's a responsibility. But in, in economics, it's a tax. And a tax for every one of us here is a burden. So, we don't want to serve the Lord. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have shown towards his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and ye minister. Everything we do for God, he notes it down. He notes it down when we do it, he notes it down how we did it, he notes down the condition of our. God is not unrighteous. He's not like men who don't see what you've done in the background. But sometimes you do extra work and you don't get the credit for it. You don't get commended for it. Sometimes you do extra work on your job. Nobody sees it. Nobody says thank you. And then you think, well, why should I do it then? What's the point? Somebody else does it and they do up front so everybody sees. But they get praised. Oh, well done. You did so good. You didn't do yours so everybody saw it, but you did it. As humans, we feel away sometimes. And we feel, I'm not going to do that anymore. Because nobody's giving me any, nobody's giving me any credit. Nobody's giving me the pat on the back. And everybody likes to hear well done. Everybody likes a pat on the back. But God is unrighteous that he's going to forget your work. Remember, it's a duty. And with duties, it involves work. It involves service. God is unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you show towards his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints. And Jesus said it this way, whatever you do unto the least of these, you do it unto me. So the little children that are sitting in the congregation, if we do something good for them, we're really doing it to Christ. We're really doing it as to the Lord. We're told that when we go to work, be not as men pleasers with eye service, but when you work, if you're working in a hospital and you're a nurse, you do it as unto the Lord. If you work in a school and you're helping the children to get their education, you do it as unto the Lord. If you're working in a factory, you do it as unto the Lord. He sees. He sees the heart that we do things with. So, our duty now has got to be a labor of love. So we all have a duty. Duty calls. But our duty has to be a labor of love. It's going to be work. We're, we're here to work for God. We're not here just to do things for ourselves. Yes, we do get the benefit sometimes of doing things that we enjoy. But the, the call of Christ has to come first. His duty calls to us. Paul says it in a different way in 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 2. 1 Thessalonians 1, 2, he says, Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love 
and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. So, there's a work of faith. There's a labor of love. Now, James tells us this way. He says, faith without works is dead. Leave it alone. So, you can't work unless you have love. Because otherwise you'll be disgruntled. It was Jacob in the Bible who wanted to marry Rachel. And he served the seven years for Rachel. On the wedding night, he would cheat. And Laban gave him Leah instead. So now Jacob has to work another seven years. But he says he did it. And it seemed like nothing because of the love that he had for her. So if you love, you work. And it will, you, it won't even seem like much because you love. If we love Christ, we'll work. If we don't love him, we're going to complain. We're going to grumble. Oh, you have to find it again. Oh, we're in prayer meeting again. And that's what we're going to be doing. Because we don't love. We have to love God. Galatians 5, 6. Galatians 5, 6. Is it this way? For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which is wrought by love. Right. Let's try. to serve God. Unless we love Christ, work is going to seem hard. But if we love Christ, then we can work. Now, sometimes we have to work by faith. Because he doesn't always explain why he wants us to do things. He's sometimes, I don't know, sense. have you ever heard the Lord just say, Go on, go on a, a two day fast, go on a three day fast, and you're thinking, why? You sometimes you, you even cook the food, you cook the dinner already, and you can smell the food and it smells good, but you hear the voice of God say, Go on a three day fast, and you're thinking, but what the Lord is doing, that not good. But the Lord says, Go on a three day fast. We don't understand why, but if you've got faith, you believe and you say, okay, God, nevertheless, he, you know, Peter was in the boat and they toiled all night and they tried to catch fish, didn't catch anything. And then Jesus says, let down your net on the right side for a catch of fish. Peter says, I didn't understand it because they toiled, they, they worked all night, toil means work all night. But he said, nevertheless, at thy will, I will let down the net. So he lets down the net. And they catch so much fish. Now, if we understand everything, Jesus didn't explain to him. He just said, let down the net. And so, for us to work for God, we have to have faith. Faith, though, the Bible tells us that it's worth so if we're struggling with faith, it's really that we're struggling with love. Faith worketh by love. If you love God, if I love God, we're going to have faith. So really, the lesson here in St. Luke 17, it's talking about the servant's faith without actually saying it. The servant's faith, because faith worketh by love. Now, faith, if it works by love, and we've got to try and serve God and please God. The disciples in the, in the, the little bit before, Jesus said, if somebody offends you, 
pages, seven times, seven times seven measures, which is impossible to do And they say, increase our faith. One of the things that we sometimes don't do, because in the scripture, we've got chapters and we've got little subheadings and so on. But look at the, the kind of overriding theme. It's about faith. Because they said, Lord, in verses, I think it's between three and six, Lord, increase our faith. Then when we go to the chapter after, the, the verses afterwards from 11 through to 19, it talks about the lepers. And the lepers that were isolated, ostracized from the community. They've got leprosy. They're not allowed to come in and mix with the community. And strangely enough, Jews hate Samaritans. They class them as half-breeds, mixed race, dual heritage, however you want to do it. They would probably use the more derogatory term. They didn't like them. They weren't. If, if those Jews were healthy, they certainly wouldn't have associated with them. But within their sickness, they all came together, Jews and Samaritans. But the only one that came, to, came back to his hands was a Samaritan. Jesus said, your faith So there's a theme running down that this text to do with faith. There's faith to forgive. There's faith that's made that Samaritan whole. And there's the faith of the servant to faithfully serve his master. Now, James said, faith without works is dead. So, faith on its own and I don't do anything with the faith. You don't see it. You don't hear it. You don't notice it. It doesn't accomplish anything. But faith now, when I start to put it into work and get action. The faith that we have as Christians is really so that we can do the work of God. If you've got faith and you can raise the dead, it's a work of God. If you've got faith and you heal the sick, it's a work of God. If you've got faith and you turn water into wine to feed the hungry people, it's a work of God. So really what we need now is faith so that we can work. But saints, we've got to check now. If our faith is weak, Peter said that he was, he would in the garden, he said he would, he died with Christ. And then when push came to shove, the Bible says that they all forsook him and fled. Jesus said, when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. When you've got this thing deep in your heart, when you realize that you said to another, he said, well, look when Jesus rose, and the disciples had gone back fishing. They'd gone back fishing, and they saw Jesus on the, on the shore. John must have said, this is not Jesus, said the Lord. Peter dives into the water. Dives into the water. Because he's got unfinished business. The last time Peter has seen, or, or the time that Peter has seen Jesus, was when Jesus turned and looked at him and cock crew three times. Jesus comes and meets the disciples all in the room, but they're all together. Peter wants a private moment where he can go to Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm sorry. Sorry that I betrayed, not, not betrayed, sorry that I denied you. 
So he jumps out the boat, swims in the water, comes over. Now, it was a lack of faith, Peter had. But check out what Jesus says to Peter. He gives him three questions. He said to Peter, why did you betray me? Is that what he said? No. He said, Peter, did he, did he go, Peter, why did you give up? No. His question was about love. He said to me, lovest thou me more than these? Remember, the issue was betrayal. The issue was a lack of faith. Because Peter didn't have the faith and the strength to stand up and say, yes, I'm one of his disciples. It was a lack of faith he had. Jesus kept goes straight to the point. He says, lovest thou me more than these? Feed my sheep. That was betrayal number one, denial number one, I should say. He asked him again, lovest thou me more than these? That was denial number two. Feed my lambs. Then he asked Peter the third time, lovest thou me more than these? So I'm saying this, Jesus showed us that faith, it works by love. Jesus had to be sure now, Peter, do you love me? If you love me and truly love me, I know that your faith will come forth to me as well. And so the Lord was speaking to me. And I was just sharing, just want to share it with you this morning. When I heard, when we heard that the Queen died, and I sat down and I was thinking, Lord, what am I going to say to the people of God this morning? I just heard the phrase. But it's not the Queen's duty now. It is my duty to go. It is my duty. It's our duty to go. Do we serve until we're tired and then we give up? Do we serve until we're frustrated? Do we serve until something goes wrong? Do we serve until somebody upsets me? Now, I'm not going to sing on the choir anymore. I used to come and clean the church, but nobody's telling me thank you. So I'm not going to come and do it anymore. I used to be on the praise and worship team. I'm not going to do it anymore. But will we serve out of love? It's not a question that I want you to answer verbally. It's really what I want you to look at inside and say, do I love God? Was my service show? doing my duty as a chore, as a burden? Is it a taxation on my life? The Lord blesses us with life and I'm, and I'm going to go to church. It's a beautiful sunny day. I'm going to go to the park. I'm going to say it's a taxation on your life. It's not a labour of love. It's something that, you're, that you, you feel that you're forced to do. I'm forced to come to church. If I don't, then a couple of weeks, then Bishop's going to ring me and say, where were you? That's not your love. That's a taxation. That's a tax being put on your life. When God wants us to serve him out of love. Everything we do has got to be out of love. So this morning, is our love Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not prophecy and have not love, sorry. Though I prophesy, though I speak with tongues, though I raise the dead and I don't have love. It's not love. Because God wants us to serve him out of love. That's why Revelation tells us It's not even a it's not even a big knock. It's not even a, a banging down the door knock. It's just a gentle come in, come in. I want to sit with you. I want to sup with you. I want to share with you. I can share my mind. I can share my heart. For God so loved the world. 
John chapter 316, for God so loved the world that he gave. So he loves, and that's all he wants in return. He doesn't want money. He doesn't need money. The Bible tells me that a cattle on a thousand hills are his. He doesn't need money. He doesn't need my ideas. He doesn't need it. He created the universe. He created rain. You know the world is never really going to run out of water. We said that there's going to be a water shortage. But there's not going to run out of water. We've got the same amount of water that we had in the beginning. Because there's something called the water cycle. The water just gets recycled. It goes up. Condensation. Rain comes down. Goes down in the field. Evaporation goes up. It just goes down in the cycle. So we don't really run out of water. We misuse the water. So we don't have readily available at our disposal drinking water because it needs to be filtered, because it needs to be treated. But we don't really run out of water. Why? Because God made the world sustainable. We talk about sustainable energy. God already sorted that. He put the sun up in the sky. It's sustainable energy. If the sun is taken away, me and you die. If the sun is taken away, the food doesn't grow. If the sun is taken away, the trees, the plants, none of them grow. Because God already made the world sustainable. He doesn't need our input. What he wants is our obedience. What he wants is our service. But he wants us to serve him out of love. It just says nothing. And the Bible tells us, St. John 14, I think it is, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now he goes beyond just a strict keeping of the law. Because the Bible talks about the commandments should be written in my heart. Because Israel had them on tablets of stone. And Israel was ceremonially obeying the law. And they were religiously following what they could do and making sure that they looked good in the sight of people. But God saw their hearts. And God said, these people serve me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And so God sees us whether our heart is far from him. Just coming to church, hey, for me, for me and you, that's okay. Oh, good to see Brother Adrian. Good to see Deacon Stephen. Good to see Brother Reese. I see you in church. We're dressed up in our finery and we think all is well. But then God looks at a different thing. God looks at the heart and says, You didn't come because you love me. You came because it was rude to love me. You came because your parents told you to come. You came because if you don't come, you don't want people questioning you where you've been. There's no love. service. And we have to serve. There's nobody that's called to walk with Christ and they're called to just sit down and put, cut, cut tent. Put out, put out a deck chair, put up your parasol and you've got your cold drink beside you. And you just say, Serving God means to praise him when you don't feel like it. It means to shout a praise and you've been a bad and you and, and you've had a bad day. Nothing's got right. But when we come into the house of God, we come in singing. We come in joy. Not joy because all of my circumstances are fine, but joy because God is constant. Because God is secure. Because God loves me. I don't know if I'm I don't know if I'm getting through or if it's making any sense. disciples said, Lord, increase our faith. Really what they were asking is, God, keep my commitment. 
you know, if you are married, and some of you may be married, you have to find out how to love your spouse. So, your spouse may like a foot rub. If they like a foot rub, and you give them a foot rub, if you find out that they like it, you'll continue to do it. If you find out that your husband, then say, doesn't like feet, don't let go of them. If you find out your wife doesn't like fish, why would you cook fish? You do what you realize they enjoy. That's you showing love to them. So, how do we show love to God? Because some of you may be thinking, well, I don't know how to love God more. How do I love God more? He said it simply, if you love me, keep my commandments. So, what does that mean? That means I'm going to have to read the book. Read the book and say, God, what is it that you want? What is it that you want? What is it that it says? The manual for love. It's, it's almost like the, um, what would you call it? Marriage guidance counseling. It's in the book. We read the book because we're married to Christ. That's our husband. So we have to, be, we have to find out what pleases Christ. Grumpiness doesn't Ungratefulness doesn't please him. Hard-heartedness doesn't please him. Meanness doesn't please him. Spitefulness doesn't please him. Because those, the Bible tells us, are the works of the flesh. So none of that pleases him. And he tells us plainly in it's Galatians 5, I think it is, 17 maybe to 19, that tells us the works of the flesh. And that tells us what he doesn't like. So he hasn't left us guessing. He's told us, I don't like this. Don't do it. Then he tells us what he does like. Now the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. He tells us what he does like. So that we can know how to love him properly. And as we love him properly, our faith begins to grow. And as our faith begins to grow, we can't see idols. We're now duty bound to work. But we don't work because we have to. We work because we love. This morning, God wants us to love Him more. And as we love Him more, we'll be able to work for Him. If I
life get in the way. Sometimes the pressures of life get in the way. Sometimes family gets in the way. Sometimes disappointment and heartache gets in the way. But the Lord says, I want you to love me. Continue to minister to them. 
if the secrets of their home, in the stillness of their beds at night, speak to them clearly so that they will understand, hearken, and know that thus say the Lord. Father, draw those that need to be drawn into your kingdom to serve you, hallelujah, with their heart, with their mind and spirit of love and faith. Draw them. For the Bible says that if you don't draw them, if you don't draw them, so Father, right now we speak and command those things that we not as though we draw them back into your kingdom. In the name of Jesus, put them in their rightful position that they will serve you. With a heart of love, faith and commitment. Go before us, Lord God. Put your hands upon us to sit with today, right now, in the name of Jesus Christ. Gabriel and Michael, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to put your hand upon him. Cover him with the blood of Jesus. Deliver him. From all that is set against them, we bind you in the name of Jesus Christ. No sickness, no disease in the name of Jesus Christ. We render you harmless and ineffective in Jesus' name. Go before us, we pray. Take full control. Thank you for the visitors. Go before them. Continue to bless them. Bless them. In every area of their life, Lord God. Father, we leave everything into your hands. In Jesus' name.